All right. Today is Wednesday, December 8th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's dive right into it. In focus, let's talk about the truckers shortage. Is it a myth or is it real? Then let's talk about macro. We got a lot of data for you. And lastly, let's answer some criticism about this channel. You are clueless, bro. We'll see. But let's start with this. The labor shortage, specifically the truckers shortage, because we have the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, coming out yesterday. And she said that perhaps the labor shortage will last with us all the way till next year. And look at Janet Yellen. She doesn't look happy at all. She looks absolutely miserable. She looks happier when she's at the casino printing money courtesy of the taxpayer. But the phenomenon we're having right now in the economy is the supply chain crisis. We have goods stuck at ports and everybody's complaining and pinning the shortages and supply chain crisis on the thing but the thing is not responsible for it it comes it goes and we're still facing supply chain problems so they're blaming the shortage in truckers if we have more truckers then things will move fast problem solved we have a shortage in truckers this is the narrative of course for example listen to this headline it reads truck driver shortage i've never quite seen it this bad in 30 years analyst said or says and this is an analyst not a truck driver but i guess wall street analysts are so arrogant these days they think they're truck drivers they think they're laborers they think they're doctors you hear analysts the likes of tom lee giving predictions and calls about the pandemic jp morgan analysts today also predicted that stocks will go higher because next year will mark the end of the pandemic you know the doctors from jp morgan and here's a take from a lobbyist for the trucking industry he or she says on the driver shortage if the job that you're offering sucks is the solution really to go find more suckers or should you improve the job i say here here and now they're debating a solution of hiring teenagers to drive trucks and this will be disastrous you know TikToking while you're driving a truck not gonna work and we already have truckers right now on the job saying they're willing ready and able to do the job but there are logistical and red tape from the government and these problems are causing the shortages meaning there is no legitimate shortage in truckers but there is red tape preventing these truckers from moving on and around However, there is another problem that perhaps truckers don't want to talk about, which is the fact that they're high in the sky and coked up like Jerome Powell. Supply chain stalled by 72,000 truckers who failed strict drug tests. So what kind of drugs are these truckers taking? Here it is. The biggest number of clearinghouse violations by far, 56%, are for, uh, can I say this one or not? Uh, you know, the thing that gets you high, the good stuff, according to federal data. And then something of mine and the other thing of mine violations account for 18%. While cocaine, we can say cocaine, it's okay. The robot police are okay with coke. And various opioids account for 15% of 4% respectively. Some argue that because Marie, Juan, and Anna can stay in the body for up to 30 days testing does not accurately reflect whether a person is driving while under the influence and i say you know what i used to be a truck driver before and it's not just the drugs it's the ambien the pain pills the gambling the hookers the smoking and a lot more but here is the reality about the truck driver shortage there is no shortage of u.s truck drivers what mind blown what's going on right what are you talking about, bro? Hold your horses, calm down, get yourself another diaper, and maybe another adult beverage. Of your choice, of course. The mention of driver shortage in earnings calls is rising sharply. These are companies, perhaps consumer staple companies and miners, complaining about the driver shortage of truckers. But here is the reality. The assertion that the U.S. is suffering from the latest round of a 16-year truck driver shortage is misleading at best. About 2 million American Americans work as licensed truck drivers, and states issue more than 450,000 new commercial driver's licenses every year, according to the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. In fact, it is the most common job in 29 states. Pay attention now. The problem is retention. Case in point, me. Many of those licensed drivers are no longer behind the wheel because they can find better working conditions and pay elsewhere. 
Jobs in factories, construction sites, and warehouses pay similar wages and do not require people to work 70 hours a week, sleep in parking lots, or wait in line for hours without pay or bathroom breaks to pick up a container at an overwhelmed port. The real shortage is of good trucking jobs that can attract and retain workers in a tight labor market. The annual turnover of drivers at big trucking companies averaged 94% between 1995 and 2007, according to ATA statistics. That means those companies have to refill almost every driver position every year to replace the people who are leaving. A third of drivers quit within the first three months of the job or on the job. The problem is particularly acute for long-haul truck drivers who carry goods great distances across state lines. And I used to do the same thing, by the way. I used to transport toxic waste for miners across state lines. The most horrific job you can get. But I was young. I did not have pain, physical pain of driving, long hours. I wasn't married. I didn't have a family. I had no obligations at all. I could travel all night. I had a lot of flexibility as a young man behind the wheel. The problem is when you have the majority, and this is the majority of truckers, of course, they tend to be slightly older. At the time, I was the youngest one. They called me kid. They were all older than me. But I noticed the theme here. They were all miserable, tired, and overworked. So they did a lot of drugs. They took a lot of pills, Ambien and the likes, pain pills. They gambled a lot. They smoked a lot. They didn't see their families for a long time. They hung out with hookers. They faced a lot of problems. And for the pay, it wasn't worth it. They were stressed out and the job was horrifying. Without truckers, the entire economy crumbles. But there was little appreciation of all of these truckers. And therefore, they kept telling me, kid, find another job. And I said, you know what? I like the job. It gives me a lot of flexibility. I get paid a lot. At the time, it was a lot for me. But for them, with a the family and kids, not so hot so. So the older truckers kept telling me, kid, leave. Find another job. The hell are you doing here hanging around with us? Anyways, back to the article. Economic theory suggests that when there is a shortage of something, in this case workers willing to drive trucks, prices or wages will rise and more people will be motivated to supply it. Makes sense, right? The balance between supply and demand. Eventually, the shortage should abate. Yet the quote-unquote driver shortage rhetoric has been repeated by the trucking industry since the late 1980s. This is not a new phenomenon, folks. The writer asks... How could such a clear shortage persist for three decades in a market economy? In 2019, two economists for the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, a.k.a. The Kitchen, set out to investigate the mystery, the perpetual driver shortage. Was there something fundamentally broken about the trucking labor market? The short answer they found is no. The labor market for trucking works about the same as the labor market for all sorts of blue-collar work. Differences in pay entice workers to enter the truck driving industry and leave it for better opportunities. There is thus no reason to think that, given sufficient time, driver supply should fail to respond to price signals in the standard way the authors wrote. In other words, raise wages and the workers will come. Ah, uh, 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 I disagree. Yes, wages should go higher, much higher. But workers will come, they're not going to stay though, because we have more problems than just wages. And as you can see, the writer is right on the first part, that if you raise wages, you're going to see workers showing up. There is a correlation between wage hikes and the number of truckers. When you hike wages, they're going to show up. The problem is retention. As you can see, U.S. trucker employment lost the trend line after the pandemic, but it could climb that easily with higher wages. The reason is we have a lot of truckers who retired. What a lot of you don't understand is when you reach a certain age as a trucker, you're going to experience a lot of pain, a lot of physical pain. And I knew truckers, all the truckers who took a lot of pills for pain. They're sick and tired of not seeing their families. They're sick and tired of the job, the obligations, and how demanding it is. We also have a problem with the infrastructure and the services for truckers. There are no places to sleep. There are no places to go to the bathroom. I hate to reveal it, but I knew all the truckers who had to wear diapers, adult diapers, to do the job. No places for food, etc., etc. And as you can see, the average wage for truckers have been historically higher than regular wages. But in recent years, it went down and only started to perk up higher after the pandemic. 
I say that truckers are the most essential workers in this economy, and they need to be treated like pilots, with better wages, better benefits, and better accommodations. And of course, in conclusion, the writer starts to spew the propaganda that the solution is to pass the Build Back Better plan, yada, yada, yada. We're not going to go over that. But yes, infrastructure needs to be improved. By infrastructure, we mean more stops, more food places, more places to go to the bathroom, to rest and sleep. But ask yourself a question here. Are they really going to spend the money on infrastructure or are they going to spend it on the Smithsonian Museum and to their buddies? This is the problem that we have with the Build Back Better scam. Next, let's talk macro, because today we got the jolts, the jolts, and we have more job openings than anticipated. Matter of fact, even more job openings were posted in October, while quits stayed near record highs. What are they talking about here? Job openings surged higher to 11 million jobs. We have 11 million jobs open right now and they cannot fill these jobs. And another 4.2 million Americans quit, so we have more vacancies now. Yet people don't want to work anymore, because money is abundant, the tsunami of liquidity that the Fed printed out of thin air is keeping workers from filling these jobs. Here's the problem with this situation. Number one, it will cause severe wage inflation. Now, you might say this is good because our wages are rising higher. Yes, on face value, in the beginning, but wage inflation is nasty, and the reason is, it has ripple effects across the economy. When you have wages rising higher, this is an input cost increase on corporations, on employers. They're going to pass that extra cost on the end consumer, meaning you and I, including us who got the wage increases. Number two, with wage increases, now you have workers with higher purchasing power. They're going to compete on apartments. They're going to compete on used cars and goods and services, you combine that with the shortages in supply and you have the perfect storm for endless inflation that continues to go higher and higher and higher. And this is the dilemma that the Fed is facing right now. A lot of you say the Fed will never raise interest rates, bro. Stop it with the Fed. Excuse me, the FUD. Stop it with the FUD, bro. They're never going to increase interest rates. Ask yourself a question. Are you really that stupid? They're going to keep interest rates low so your stocks can go higher. Are you a mega donor? Did you pay politicians? Because the mega donors already sold their stocks. They got the memo from the Fed. The party is over. We have no other choice but to tighten. If the Fed continues to ignore this, it will become an endemic problem in this economy, and it will lead to stagflation, and therefore the Fed is panicking to at least psychologically remove some of that inflation from the system, meaning they are hoping that by messaging a hawkish stance, the psychological element of inflation will take place and inflation will recede. The problem is if it doesn't, then they're going to have to follow up on their tough talk. They're going to have to taper aggressively by ending all purchasing programs by this month and then raising interest rates starting as early as March of next year. Powell said, I have a substantial further progress when it comes to raising interest rates. He is now realizing that full employment is already here. We have 11 million jobs open, more jobs than those looking for one. And where are these jobs, you might ask? Here it is. Hotels and restaurants posted 254,000 openings in October, more than any other sector. Non-durable goods manufacturers followed with 45,000 new postings, and education services listed 42,000 new positions. Openings led by 115,000 across state and local government roles excluding education, according to the report. So we're seeing the private sector expanding and the public sector, the government jobs, receding. Because you have workers switching from public, working for the government to the private sector. And this is, by the way, moving wages even higher. You're seeing the exodus from government jobs because these workers are finding better pay in the private sector, yet adding more problems for Jerome Powell regarding inflation. And then we got sentiment from small businesses, and hint, not good. They're not happy at all. The latest CNBC Momentum small business survey shows a decline in small business confidence in Biden's approval ratings, with respondents who identify as independents primarily responsible for the downshifting and concerns about inflation a major influence over the data. Concerns over the labor shortage remain high, but even more. Small business owners are seeing higher prices and supply chain disruptions. According to the survey, 75% of small business owners say they're experiencing higher supply costs, up from 70% in the third quarter, 
58% are experiencing supply chain disruptions, up from 55%. Inflation tops the list of concerns, with 34% of small business owners citing it as the biggest risk to their business, followed by supply chain disruptions. This is 23%, and then the thing at 17%. So again, do you want to continue to destroy small businesses in this country? There is a limit. There's a political cost. So when you say Jerome Powell is not going to tighten, he's just bluffing. There is a political cost here. Do you really think that Joe Biden did not have this talk with Jerome Powell before the redomination? That you gotta kill this inflation, otherwise you're not gonna get the job because this inflation is costing me politically. We have an election in 2022. We're gonna lose the elections if inflation persists. And there's this myth, of course, of the separation from the government and the Federal Reserve. That's all bullshit, of course. They talk all the time. Powell did not get the job because he's not gonna taper and he's not gonna tighten. He got it because he has to crush this inflation. It is in his job description right now. And yes, there's a price to pay, and that will be equities prices going down, real estate prices perhaps going down. But the bet is that it's going to be a soft blow, not a hard blow. By November, the economy and the equities market will recover and start perking up higher again. In my opinion, of course, this is wishful thinking. Not going to happen. What they're going to find out is that this inflation is harder to beat than they thought. And they're going to have to be even more aggressive. Because when you think about it, what is the number one source of deflation in the last two decades at least? The answer is China. Well, China is inflationary right now, not deflationary. Xi Jinping wants common prosperity. He doesn't want Chinese laborers working for starvation wages, making goods for American companies. Either you're going to pay them more in China, and you have to deal with shipping costs and disruptions. And the alternative is, and this is the movement, by the way, worldwide to move the supply chain domestically and that takes a lot of time and a lot of money and you're gonna have to pay wages and wages here are even higher than china it is becoming also a national security issue the reliance on china that is and therefore you bet your ass that inflation will continue to go higher and goods will cost more because we're gonna have to move them here to be manufactured here in the united states and we're gonna have to pay american wages which are rising higher and higher and higher and you wonder why the fed is paying panicking right now you really think they're not going to raise interest rates yes they're going to be a lot of casualties but this is what is needed because they're already too late to the game and by the way while small businesses suffer what about big businesses large enterprises public companies are they also suffering because the hacks at the media say inflation is good for the poor bad for the rich really while small businesses suffer companies are pocketing their fastest fastest forget about fastest fattest profits in more than 70 years, even as they complain about inflation. Roughly four out of five companies surveyed by the Richmond Federal Reserve reported hiking up prices for consumers to cover quote-unquote at least some of the input costs they were experiencing. Pay attention now. But those same executives have been a bit more discreet. Apart from their quarterly earnings calls about celebrating the record profit margins they've been able to achieve by not only passing costs on to consumers, but by charging even more. So if they're incurring $2 more, they're charging you 3 just so you understand how inflation works. And yes, small businesses are also participating in jacking prices higher. They have to. But their ability to absorb raising prices higher versus large enterprises is a lot weaker. More than half of the companies surveyed by the Small Business Services Review's website digital.com reported raising prices beyond what was required to offset rising input costs. In other words, businesses are inflating already inflated prices in order to turn a bigger profit amid people's fears over uncertain times. So even small businesses are jacking prices higher beyond the inflation costs. This is what the Fed is dealing with right now. This is what they did not anticipate. The ripple impacts that go beyond their control. But here's the catch. Additionally, large firms were more likely to engage in this practice than small businesses the survey found. Surprise, surprise. In fact, the latest data from the U.S. Commerce Department shows that the last time corporate profit margins were so large was December 1950. Even as ports battled bottlenecks, oil prices subside and workers filled jobs, easing pressure on corporate margins, elevated prices have drawn accusation of gouging by Biden. They're not really price gouging. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're taking advantage of this inflation by raising prices as much as they can and using inflation as an excuse. And so long as the consumer is receptive to price increases, 
prices, they're going to continue to go higher and higher and higher. The consumer is receptive for now. Why? The stimmies, then comes the savings, then comes the credit cards, and then the whole party blows up with no more stimmies. And I know what you're going to say, but by then, inflation will subside, right? Because the demand will go down. No more yayo. The consumer will not be able to support higher prices. The problem is you cannot guarantee that prices will go down, and thus the phenomenon of stagflation. Kroger cannot lower prices on consumers even if the demand goes down. And the reason is the suppliers are not going to lower their prices. And the reason is the farmers supplying those suppliers are not going to lower their prices. Because we have a socialist system where the dear government subsidizes farmers. Otherwise, they're going to quit the job. Farmers have an endless inflow of cash from the government. Deer knows that, so deer is jacking up prices for equipment. Fertilizer providers are also jacking up prices knowing that farmers can pay more. Now, farmers are going to pay more, but they're also anticipating to receive more. Combine that with the phenomenon of climate change and the drought and higher grains prices, and you can see why stagflation could be a reality. Now, let's move on to answer some criticism regarding this channel. And I'm going to read some comments for you. I don't mean to pick on these people, by the way. I encourage all kind of participation and dialogue in the comments section. The good, the bad, the ugly, doesn't matter to me. The more engagement, the better. But we have to answer some of these criticisms because we have new viewers all the time. Take, for example, this comment that says, I have never used this term before, but holy the FUD from this channel. I used to get value from here, but this channel has turned, turns, turned, whatever, into constant limitations of a man who has missed the train and is desperately trying to make himself believe that there is going to be a crash soon so that he can get back into the game. Are you 11 years old? Anyways, oh and by the way, to all of you Burma Bears out there, you missed the biggest Black Friday sale. We'll see. But keep in mind this, he says, I missed the train and I desperately want to crash so I can buy the market. You know, Charlie Munger also criticized the market a few days ago, so I guess Charlie Munger is waiting for the crash so he can buy and Charlie Munger is missing out, right? He's jealous of your gains, bro. <laughs> and by the way, if you are a perma bull and you believe that the market is going to continue to go higher and higher and higher, and the Fed is not going to tighten, the Fed is not going to raise interest rates, and this is different this time around, bro, why bother watching this channel? right? Why bother? The market is working your way. You don't have to answer every different opinion. You don't have to pay attention to any different opinion. Or perhaps it is insecurity. You know you're wrong and therefore you're running around the internet looking for the opposite opinion, looking for the devil's advocate. Here's another one that says the best perma bear channel on YouTube. And he says that he lost money listening to this channel, yada, yada, yada. First of all, I challenge you to bring any time where I said, I'm giving you advice to buy or sell. I'm asking you to buy or sell so-and-so. I challenge you to find that because it never happened. In this channel, I only discuss my views and what I'm doing, what I'm seeing. I never give you advice to buy or sell. But let's address this criticism right here and set the record straight with the facts. When they say that I'm missing out and I did not participate in this, yada, yada, yada. First of all, I've seen bubbles before. I've traded them. I've invested in them. This is not my first rodeo. I know exactly how to handle these bubbles. And I give you all the time in this channel, trading ideas, investment ideas, fundamental analysis, where we go over stocks and earnings, and I tell you exactly what I'm buying, what I'm selling. But guess what? The videos where we cover the fundamentals, the earnings, these videos get the lowest views. Viewers are not interested in viewing these type of videos. When we go over the fundamentals, and I tell you exactly what I'm buying, what I'm selling, and why, based on the fundamentals. I have also guided you through investment trends throughout this bubble since the beginning. For example, last year, I was talking about copper and Freeport McMoran when nobody was talking about it. Everybody thought that the end is here. It's all about tech. Freeport was trading at around 10 bucks, lower than 10 bucks. Guess where it's trading right now? We've been talking about FCX. We've been talking about the bullish outlook for copper in China. And this is from last year, the summer of last year. I also gave you GM last year when nobody wanted GM. Everybody was chasing Tesla. GM was the dying dinosaur. And I told you it's going to be a hot EV play. And since that time, GM has doubled, more than doubled in value. I gave you Disney last year. And every thesis, every idea I give you is based on the fundamentals and a thorough analysis. This is when nobody wanted to buy Disney. The parks are closed, yada, yada, yada. And this is from August of last year. 
I made a video on July 16th, over 30 minutes, and it didn't matter to me. It got over 100 views, a little over 100 views, but it didn't matter to me. In this channel, I will make an hour video with thorough analysis. It doesn't matter if we have 60 people watching, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, doesn't matter to me. But the title of the video reads, The Upcoming Market Rotation. And we talked about the end of the rally in the NASDAQ. It's going to cool off. You're going to see the giants consolidating. Or we're going to see a rotation to the IWM. This is back in July of last year when the IWM was viewed as toxic waste with the reopening names. Nobody wanted to touch them back then. And I told you this is the opportunity to rotate to these names. I gave you a thorough analysis on August 10th of 2020 the rotation from big tech the Qs to small caps the iwm we made a list and all of these names on your right hand side were absolutely crushed and the opportunity was to buy them while they're cheap and now you know what happened they all rallied higher names like mgm disney southwest gm the opportunity was in rotating to these names because names like amazon apple facebook did not move at all and certain names even crashed after that like docusign zoom peloton zillow certain names continued to rally like tesla google etc but the opportunity at that time was to rotate from the queues to small caps and i guided you step by step on how to do that August 12, 2020, I said take the IWM pill. I gave you the red pill, the blue pill. The red pill is the small caps that nobody wants. The blue pill is the cues that everybody's chasing. We started buying names like Cisco, American Express, Disney. I even outlaid a thesis for you for Kroger. And this is in the summer of 2020. And look at how well Kroger performed. We're not chasing YOLO names. We're not chasing Hertz. We're not chasing GameStop. We're not chasing the hot names that pop higher and crash right away. We're chasing solid companies with excellent cash positioning, with excellent earnings earnings because in the long run you're gonna outperform the SPY, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ and even the YOLO names because the YOLO names will be sexy in the beginning but then they crash and when the dust is settled you end up outperforming all of these morons following the fundamentals. I also gave you the agricultural stocks and look at how well these stocks have done since last year. As we got closer to the elections the talking heads on TV, the experts said if Biden gets elected this will be the worst thing that ever happened to oil. Oil is going to crash. You got to sell Exxon, sell Chevron, yada, yada, yada. And I told you back then, if Biden gets elected, this will be the most bullish catalyst for oil prices since 2007. And this is exactly what happened. And I gave you before the elections, Exxon Mobil as a name for the Biden picks. I also gave you the Biden stocks. And the majority of these stocks outperformed the rest of the market since the elections. I gave you STZ. On November 2nd, 2020, look at how well that stock has done since. This year, in January and February, we talked about earnings, and I gave you names like Fortinet. Do yourself a favor, by the way, and pull up a chart of Fortinet, the ticker FTNT. Look at how well that stock has done since the beginning of the year. Did you guys watch that video, the earnings review that I've done for FTNT? Of course not, but I outlaid my thesis for that investment back then. I bought McAfee at that time. McAfee exploded higher, and then it crashed and went private, but that was a massive opportunity because the name has doubled since then. I gave you Goldman Sachs. We talked about Goldman Sachs, names like Ford. This is during the beginning of the year. We've been talking about Goldman Sachs. We've been talking about Ford. All of these names exploded higher since then. Meanwhile, the big caps, the sexy names, the majority of them either crashed or traded sideways, and they were not moving at all. Case in point, Amazon and Apple. And this was part of the rotation, by the way, from the reopening to the value names. And then I gave you names like regional banks, like USB, for example, in January. Look at how well that stock has done since. Even in short ideas, I have a long portfolio, I have a short portfolio. Since last year, September of 2020, we started talking about shorting certain stocks, like Peloton, DocuSign, Zoom. Fast forward a year later, and look at what happened to these stocks. Another one, the RKK, when I shorted RKK, January 26, 2020. Do yourself a favor, pull up that chart and look at how close that was to the top. Even trades, puts or calls. Take, for example, the put trade for Viacom that happened to be exactly at the top before the crash of Arkegos. Now, if I see the name reaching 100, I will be shorting with both hands and perhaps they will push it to 98 99 and then reverse it before reaching 100 so if we get closer to 100 i will be shorting the name with both hands the bottom line here folks is my strategy has worked having a long and a short portfolio strategy surgically picked 
stocks has been outperforming the market this year. So I say number one, stop thinking about me. If I'm missing the rally or not, I'm doing fine. My clients are happy, I'm happy, everybody's happy. Number two, painting the channel as a perma bear channel just shows your stupidity or the fact that you're not watching. And I know by design, we make these videos 30, 40, 50 minutes. And this is by design intended to weed out the Nimrods. I don't want those traders and gamblers who want the tickers or chasing names, chasing the mania because they're going to get flushed out quickly. Two years from now, they're not going to even exist. Look at certain channels, for example, or pumping GME, GameStop, and AMC. They had millions of subscribers. But right now, they barely get 5,000, 6,000 views. This is not how I want this channel to be. Point number three. I cannot sugarcoat for you the fact that the Fed is becoming more hawkish. When you remove the support of $120 billion in assets purchasing, on top of that, you increase interest rates higher. Who's going to substitute the $120 billion in support every single month? Retail traders? Mathematically speaking, we've been expanding multiples in this market due to collapsing interest rates. If interest rates move higher, those multiples and those valuations will go down. There is no escaping this fact, folks. Number four, they say, oh, the trend is your friend. You gotta wait till the trend is over. Why fight the trend, yada, yada? You hear this garbage all the time. The trend is your friend. The trend is your friend. Here's the problem. I remember the same garbage back in the dot-com bubble and back in 2007. Here's the dot-com bubble, the cues. The trend was broken. What do you think the sentiment was when the trend was broken? I knew back then we had the spike top. It's over. It's done. The head and shoulder, it's gone. It's over. We had names crashing in 99. Theglobe.com, yada yada. You think the gamblers, the mania chasers, you think they got it when the trend was broken? Of course not. They continued to buy the dip over and over and over and over, hoping that the recency bias will serve them, and it did not. What about the 09 crash? Here's a chart of the SPY. The trend was broken back in 2008. January 2008, the trend was broken. What do you think the conversation was back then? We're gonna recover. It's just a panic. We have the double bottom. We have China. We have yada, yada, yada. It didn't matter. They continued to fight it over and over and over again, even after the trend was already broken. And in every instance, by the way, corporate insiders and the rich already dumped their stocks ahead of time. Why does this continue to happen? The reason is the gambling addiction, the psychology. When market participants are indulged blindly in these bubbles, they have the recency bias. They have the sweet taste in the mouth, the easy market. You put your blindfolds on, you buy calls, you buy random stocks, and you score. They think that this is how the market is going to operate in the long run. This is how the market operated in the past. The problem is they're only going to realize that they're wrong when it's already too late. This is basic human psychology going back to the 20s all the way till today, even though we have advanced dramatically in tech, in knowledge, in resources, but it doesn't matter. The psychology remains the same. There is a prey and there is a predator. There is a winner and there is a loser. And the winners always, always in these bubbles are the rich and the insiders. And the losers always, always are the retail crowd. And this will never change. Anyways, folks, we spend a lot of time here. Let's move on to the market's coverage, starting with the performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 35.32 points or a gain of 0.10%. The Nasdaq also closing in the green by about 100 points or a gain of 0.64%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 14.46 points or a gain of 0.31%. The outperformers today led by communication services also capturing the gold medal. And at number two for the silver, healthcare. Number three for the bronze, REITs. And the laggards of the day led by consumer defensives and financials. What about the advanced to decline ratios? The NYSE, 67% advancing versus 30% declining. The Nasdaq, 68% advancing versus 29% declining. As you can see, we're getting closer now to the flat line, the 50-50. Perhaps we should dip a little more, and we have a red day tomorrow, and then we take it from there as we anticipate the release of the CPI. Moving on to futures, starting with crude oil prices. We have modest gains today for about half a percentage point for both the WTI and Brent. But we also have gains, sizable gains, for gasoline, heating oil, natural gas. Of course, it is a relief for consumers that natural gas prices went down. But watch out here, they could climb higher again because we have a lot of short covering to be done. Years worth of short covering. What about softs? 
The silent rally in lumber goes on. We're getting closer and closer to 1,000. Likewise, we have gains for OJ, coffee, and sugar. Cocoa and cotton futures pretty much at the flat line. What about metals? What's going on here? Gold is still waiting and waiting and waiting. The dollar went down, but yields are popping higher again. And therefore, gold trading flat along with silver. But we have gains here for platinum, copper, and palladium. Copper leading the gains. And what about meats? We have losses here. Almost 1% losses for feed or cattle futures. Meanwhile, live and lean hogs futures, live cattle that is, are pretty much in the flat line with modest losses. And what about grains? We have losses led by soybean oil declining by about 3% today, along with wheat, canola, rough rice, and oats. While we have rallies led by soybean meal gaining a little over 2% today, and we have modest gains for both soybeans and corn futures. Moving on. To the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Leading the tables, the hottest table by far. Are we talking a lot? Perhaps the top for now? When you see a volume like this, you think this is a coincidence? Of course not. It is done by design to muff the shot against the market. Anyways, applet number one with over 3 million contracts trading hands today. Over 75% of those were calls. And that's it, folks. I'm calling it. Apple should start to decline from this point on, at least all the way till Friday. We'll talk about Apple in a second, but here it is at number two, Devon Energy, DVN. We have dividends, and therefore, they're dumping calls. Over 850,000 contracts traded today. 99% of those were calls. And then we have Tesla, the souffle at number three, with over 650,000 contracts contracts trading hands today, about 58% of those were calls. And notice we have a lot of dividends, by the way, Simon Properties, the same story as Devon Energy. Now, back to Apple, what's going on here? Notice that the unusual activities for Apple were all puts. We're talking for the expiration date of Friday. They're fading the pop here, buying the 175 puts, 172.5, 170, even 177.5. They're betting that Apple will go down. And I noticed by the end of the day, because if you look at the grid, these are the options for the expiration date of this Friday, the calls. The reason behind the pop in Apple is they stampeded in buying the 175 calls. Notice the volume to the open interest, almost 22 times. What does that mean? They're getting in and out. They buy them and dump them right at the same day. They're not interested in holding these contracts or owning Apple. And they actually started switching at the end of the day from the 175 calls to the 175 puts. And therefore, I followed this trade it's a spread, a put spread for Apple. And by the way, this is for the expiration date of this Friday. I always recommend that you have a minimum of two weeks in your options trading till expiration so you can have the flexibility of moving out if you're wrong with minimal losses. But these are wild shots with only two days till expiration. Wild shots were not betting the house on them and I'm using a spread. I bought the 175 puts and I sold the 170. All in all, the entry cost is around one buck and 30 cents. Now the maximum profit is five bucks. So we have about three bucks and 70 cents a piece in profit that you can make. This is your maximum profit because if Apple goes below 170, you locked your profit by the 170 because you solved them. This is again a wild shot. No guarantees here that's going to happen. We're betting against the tide. This is a tsunami if options call of call options buying, excuse me. So there is no guarantee that this is going to work, but I noticed the shift from calls to puts by the end of the day. Anyways, moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker ROKU, Roku, popping higher today, lots of short covering, and the reason is they reached a deal with Google to keep YouTube on Roku. So now we're gonna see a lot of short covering, and this is what they're betting for by buying these calls for Friday's expiration. They bought the 270 calls for the expiration date, December 10th, with expectations that Roku will pop higher by over 5% by then. They're paying a lot here. They paid almost three bucks for this trade, three bucks a piece. All in all, spending about three and a half million dollars. What about the trade, the spread for the KWEB, KWEB, the Chinese ETF for technology? They bought the 46 calls and they sold the 47 calls, all for the expiration date, December 23rd. They paid about 60 bucks for buying the 46 calls, and this is 60 bucks a piece, by the way. And they received in credit 40 bucks a piece from selling the 47 calls. All in all, the entry cost is down to 20 cents a piece. 
The maximum profit is one buck a piece. So you have 80 cents in profit, maximum profit that is. All in all, they spent about $200,000 for this trade. What about the trade for the ticker SNAP Snapchat? They're buying calls here, the 60 calls for the expiration date, December 23rd, with expectations that Snapchat could pop higher by more than 12% by then. They paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $550,000. What about the trade for the ticker DWAC? Whack the quack. The buying calls here, perhaps a squeeze. Lots of shorting in this name, perhaps politically motivated, who knows. But they're betting for a short squeeze by Friday, and they bought the 70 calls for the expiration date. December 10th, with the expectations that Dwack the Quack will pop higher by more than 6.5% by then. They paid big bucks for this one. This is too expensive, by the way, for my taste at least. 3 bucks and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, they paid about $2 million. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker HOOD, the Hood, Robin Hood? I also followed this one, and this is a wild shot because it has two days till expiration. But Robin Hood is too oversold right now. We should bounce. It could happen this week, and it could not happen this week. So this is a wild shot. Anyways, buying the 25 calls for the expiration date, December 10th, meaning Friday, with expectations that Hood will pop higher by more than 5.5% by then. And we paid about 40 cents a piece to enter the trade, all in all spending about $270 thousand dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here the ad performers obviously in a boring day not a lot of moves here but the ad performers apple do the options mania and then we had some good news regarding the thing in the morning and therefore the reopening names are also at performing whether we're talking about airlines resorts or cruises we're also seeing the short covering slash oversold bounces continuing in certain names for example, PayPal gaining another 3% today, over 3%. We have names like CrowdStrike, Uber, Square, Snapchat, Dash, Twilio, Zoom, Ruko, even Facebook was oversold, and they're all bouncing a little higher. The main concern is when traders book profits, we're assuming by the end of the week, are we going to see a follow-up, meaning rolling higher or buying the stock? I doubt it, and therefore that makes these pops unsustainable, at least for now. Moving on to charts, starting with the SPY, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? Flattish activities, no update whatsoever here. We still have the bull flag formation, we're moving a little higher here, but still overbought in the 30, on the RSI, the 30 minutes chart that is. And therefore, let's see if the chart goes down to retest 466 for support, and if it bounces higher from that point on or not. We'll look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. The volume is receding. This is a good sign for the bulls. The momentum indicators are gaining steam here. Understand the RSI is your leading indicator. The MACD is your lagging indicator. The MACD is the confirmation. So once you see the MACD popping higher with green impressions on the histogram, you have a confirmation. The bearishness is over and the bullishness is starting over again. Now from a candlestick pattern, we have a doji meaning indecisive, pretty much within range, waiting and waiting for more data, waiting and waiting for more buyers or more sellers. And of course, we're all waiting for what? We're waiting for the CPI because after the CPI, we will have more clarity on what the Fed really wants to do. And then we have a direction up or down. Moving on to the cues, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart. No update, similar to the SPY. The bull flag remains, but still overbought from an RSI perspective. And therefore, perhaps we should wait for a retest at 397. 397 is extremely important for the queues right now. And therefore, keeping 397 is a good sign for market bulls. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ? Again, the volume is down. The momentum indicators are gaining steam, but they're not positive yet at least not the MACD. We still have a doji. As of the markets across the board were traded via algos today, did not have buyers or sellers, and therefore flat, waiting and waiting and waiting for the CPI. But before the CPI, what is the bias here? We have a massive move to the upside this week, and therefore you might see some profit taking as we head closer to the CPI on Friday. So my hunch is we could trade down negatively tomorrow, not by a lot, but as we await the release of the CPI, you're going to see a lot of de risk risking from certain players in this market, specifically traders who bought the dip and they want to lock profits before any surprises. And what about the IWM 30 minutes chart? What's going on here? We still have the bull flag. The difference is between the IWM, the SPY, and the Qs, we had a retest in the morning for 223 as support. And that was confirmed for support right away. No problems here. Yet the IWM did not blast higher, meaning we have 
a shortage, perhaps exhaustion for now from buyers. A lot of hesitancy here before we head into the CPI. It's the same theme, whether we're talking about the SPY, the Qs, the Russell, doesn't matter. And what about the Dixie, the dollar index, what's going on here? It appears that the bear flag is playing out, yet Tricky Dixie is not making it easy for us. It continues to hug and hold on at 96 for support. It doesn't want to let go of 96, so we have to continue to wait and wait and wait. And perhaps we can take a page of patience from the chart of gold, which has been waiting and waiting and waiting for a decisive move from the Dixie and the 10-year yield. No move whatsoever here from gold, waiting and waiting and waiting. The line in the sand is 1,763. If that is broken, goodbye. We go down 1,685. But I have a feeling here that the Dixie will flush down and perhaps the 10-year yield will also flush down because say the CPI comes out too hot, the knee-jerk reaction will be, okay, the Fed is going to be hawkish now, the Fed is going to tighten, they're going to raise interest rates and that will push the economy into a recession. And that could tip the yield curve meaning flatten, where the two-year goes higher and the 10-year yield goes down. If that happens, the dollar and yield go down together, this will be good for gold to pop higher. But again, look at the chart of gold. It has been pretty much consolidating since the beginning of the year. No major moves whatsoever. It is boring for now. It is not sexy. We need massive pops here to attract buyers. Until then, no interest whatsoever in the chart of gold. And here is the chart of the 10-year yield. What's going on here? Recapturing 1.5% for support. The momentum indicators are gathering steam. They want to turn positive again. I hate to bore you, but it doesn't matter what the chart does right now. It's all all about the CPI and how the market will interpret the Fed's move from the CPI's reading. And here's a weekly chart for the TLT. What's going on here? It appears that we're now reversing all of the gains from last week. And the line in the sand is 149. Fans of the TLT are not happy, of course. But we talked about this in this channel for a long time now. There is a massive battle. There is a massive debate from two sides. Both of them have a persuasive argument. One side says yields will go higher. The other side says yields will crash. You cannot trade charts like this until the debate is settled. But we look at 149 as a parameter of what the sentiment is for this particular week. Is it tilting toward the team that says yields will go higher? Or is it favoring the team that says bond prices will go higher? For now, for this week, the sentiment is yields will go higher. Moving on to the VIX 4 hours chart, what's going on here? We have a confirmation, a crossing. We have red impressions on the histogram, and therefore you knew right away the SPY will pop, the VIX will lose steam. The test, however, is, and this is the most important test, will the VIX hold 20 as support or not? If it loses 20 as support, then understand that the technicals at least, forget about the fundamentals, the technicals will be supportive for the SPY to go to all-time highs. If the VIX, however, rebounds from 20, then we have a massive warning signal because that would be a higher low for the VIX. And we haven't seen a higher low for the VIX in a long time since last year. So keeping 20 as support and rebounding higher from that level will be a massive win for market bears. It will also serve as a warning signal for the bulls. What about Apple, a daily chart? What's going on here? You know the story. We have a squeeze via options, so the stock is exploding higher. And mind you, this is the biggest stock in the world. We're talking about $3 trillion that is being pushed via options. The bullish view remains. The chart is trading above the channel. And if it closes above the channel for the week, then the bullish momentum continues. But if we fall back inside the channel and we close the week below the upper end of the channel, then this is a massive reversal and perhaps the squeeze is over. But for now, from a daily perspective, we have overbought readings in the RSI and the MACD indicator. What does that mean? The risk versus reward says, if you've been long, time to take profits for now. And if you've been waiting to short via put options, a wild shot, this is the time to do so. And your target will be closing the gap, of course, and perhaps retracing that upper band, the upper line of the channel because this is a typical behavior of charts they break above the channel they go down to retest the upper band rebound from that and then either fall down back in the channel or form a new bullish trend now bear in mind that this is market manipulation there is no other way to describe it because we have actually bad news for apple in the morning 
This is the headline, Apple hit by supply crunch, so iPhone 13 production dropped 20% in recent months. But the corporate hack, the propagandist Katie Huberty says, oh, Apple is going to push higher, it's going to be 200. This news is bullish for Apple. Up is down, east is west, right? And the bad news did not stop here. Apple has allowed app developers to collect data from its 1 billion iPhone users for targeted advertising. And this is a surprise, of course, because Apple prides itself for privacy. It turns out they're actually selling data of their customers. Yet the stock continues to move higher because who cares? The mechanics are taking over right now. We'll deal with the fundamentals later. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle daily chart. What's going on here? The rescue operation continues because we discussed if Apple falls below 1000, the reverse gamma squeeze starts. And therefore, we have a rescue for now, pushing Apple above 1000, let's say comfortably, at least for now. We have a resistance line that we have to look at, which happens to be the top of the reversal candle or breakdown candle that happens to be 1090 and a half now let's say apple excuse me tesla opens higher tomorrow i will be eyeing the behavior of the chart around this number is it going to pass it easily or is it going to be rejected and if that is the case and we see a flush down for that rejection then you have a confirmation the bears have another confirmation that the tide is shifting to favor their side Moving on to tulips, BTC, what's going on here? Not looking good. Are we replacing the bear flag for now? Yes, we're getting closer to oversold readings, but this is not a good look for now. It appears as Bitcoin got a shock, a massive shock, we're still waiting and waiting to absorb that shock. And as if the chart is asking, any buyers here? Any sellers? Anything? This is the debate period, at least for now. Once the debate is over, we're going to see a massive move one way or the other. But for now, it appears to be bearish. It appears to be to the downside. Lastly, what about AMC? What's going on here? Again, the apes are listening. We told them you got to capture 32. And the apes did the deed. They bought a lot of call options. The 32 calls. And they have succeeded, at least for now, in pushing AMC above 32. Now, the next resistance that we're eyeing as support is 36 and a half, meaning you got to buy the 35 calls aggressively. Remember this, unlike Tesla, Tesla has the 950 puts expiring this week. Who knows if they're going to roll to next week or not. But if Tesla closes above 1,000 for the week, that reverse gamma goes off the table right away. The reverse gamma for AMC is still here all the way till December 17th. And you cannot afford to lose 26 because that will trigger the reverse gamma since they're buying the 25 puts aggressively so you have the bull flag for now you gotta hold on the support of 32 and roll higher to perhaps 35 hoping that amc will recapture another support of 36 and a half and then you have a lot of cushion above 26 bear in mind we have uh, gme gamestop reporting earnings after the bell and it is trading down that could indeed influence amc negatively lastly moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow the most important event is for usual, the initial jobless claims for the week, you combine that with the jolts and the report that we got last week, and we have a clear picture here what substantial further progress is and how will that tie up with the CPR reading. We also have the 30-year bond auction, and this is important because the 30-year bond actually inverted against the 20, and it has been losing steam a lot from a yield perspective, and therefore, what would the demand be? Because the 10-year note auction today was pretty much flat and boring. Are we going to see a lot of dip buying in the 30-year bond, or are they going to dump it? This will be highly critical, by the way, specifically as we head closer to the CPR reading. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.